functionality of the statehood in that aspect sovereignty is very much contested to the all the, all the most of the states of the Balkans. My question is, uh, would if the non-territorial autonomy was applied to all of you, do you think that the outcome might be different? So my my uh, my idea is maybe you go back in time, let's say from Bosnia in the Dayton Agreement, from um, Serbia in the period of Slovan Milosevic regime, and etc. So if you go back in time and uh, think about apl application of the non-territorial autonomy as a decision in aspects of the other parts that exist as a as a solution. History has a one arrow of time, you know, so. <coughs> You cannot go back properly. Uh, I'm sure, uh, more, you know, almost any solution, instead of what we actually had, would have been better. You know, so. <laughs> you know, but you know, to think now, what could have been done, it's not a very, very productive thing. You know, it, it, I, I'll be, you know, even more depressed. You know. <clears throat> but yes, NTA was would have been a, 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 a good solution. I see here people, you know, from former republics, you know, they, they, uh, I remember Serbian representatives from Croatia saying we only want cultural autonomy, but they were not uh, the, the most influential representatives. I remember <coughs> Americans who have such a bad reputation here in Serbia proposing several treaties and uh, solutions uh, about uh, joint institutions between Serbs and Albanians in Kosovo. You know, this is all ancient history. Now. The religious sites in Kosovo, uh, they belong to the Serbian Orthodox Church, no? So in this sense, the Serbian Orthodox Church would have a uh, special uh, extraterritorial, some kind of, what, what kind of, I mean, what, how, how would you imagine this non-territorial autonomous status for these religious sites? Uh, because that was not clear to me. I was merely presenting the current uh, legal framework in Kosovo. So uh, Kosovo officials and Marti Artisari were against uh, Serbian churches and monasteries having extraterritorial status. Mm -hmm. You know, so this presentation was basically about uh, the, them being framed within the Kosovo legal framework. Uh, talking about extraterritorial status would be an additional thing, you know. Embassies have extraterritorial status, yeah, yeah. you know. We can, I hope, when I spend some time with David and Robert in the UK, you know, there are various creative arrangements uh, within the United Kingdom and Commonwealth, you know. Uh, but this is not uh, extraterritorial. You know. This is simply saying that these properties are owned by Serbian Orthodox Church. That was, if you want, seen on the side of Albanians as a concession, because Albanians wanted that uh, everything is recognized as Kosovo cultural heritage, and that there is a special, you know, Orthodox Church in Kosovo, which owns Orthodox uh, properties. And to be honest, that's how things are done nowadays in the Balkans or how they are likely to be done. You know, when Macedonian Orthodox Church proclaimed its independence, mm -hmm. all sites became the property of Macedonian Orthodox Church. Whether they were built by Serbian medieval rulers or Bulgarian or, or whoever, you know. And currently the process is Montenegro, there is a tendency to have something of a similar sort. Mm -hmm. You know, to have uh, Montenegrin Orthodox Church or Montenegrin state being recognized as the ultimate owner of these properties. So, in comparison, you know, uh, Serbian Orthodox Church is doing the best in Kosovo, which is a paradox of Soedianites. Okay. I've seen that you refer to the constitution of Kosovo, and there was an interesting expression that was Kosovo heritage. I think that this is the territory of maybe confrontation or co coexistence of, of both Serbian heritage and Albanian heritage. So my question is, how would you define Kosovo heritage? And the second question, 
is do you think that there is something like Kosovian identity or Kosovian brand? Thank you. I'm not sure if I can give you a, a, a concise and accurate answer. I would need to, to think a little bit about it. Uh, I'm sure there is a Kosovo identity. There is no question about it. The question is who, uh, if you want, who breeds this identity? Is this identity that all citizens breed and to what extent or only some citizens? That's, that's the issue. Now, how would I define Kosovo heritage? That's, um, you know, that's, um, uh, I'm happy to talk in these in this terms. Uh, you know, there is, Kosovo heritage is, is a heritage of all people in Kosovo. Now, it doesn't mean that it belongs to Kosovo, you know. If there is a mosque built 500 years ago in Belgrade, you know, it's uh, Serbian heritage as, uh, in the same way as if we have Serbian citizenship. But whether this is a property of uh, Islamic community or of uh, Ministry of Culture, that's a different issue, you know. Kosovo is a very young country, not country, maybe state, okay? And I've seen a, maybe a little bit similar situation in Gdansk, where I live, that Gdansk was always, for many years, was the territory of the conflict between the Polish heritage and German heritage. And do you know what will happen after 100 years? People from Gdansk said, well, um, we think that we are neither Polish nor German, we are Danzig again. So, so there was the tendency that they created kind of Gdansk heritage. Question for the third presenter. Your title is Economic Support in the Context of NTA Arrangements. You mentioned uh, instrument for pre-accession, right, finances. Yeah. Maybe I missed, but I wonder whether there are funds allocated specifically for mm -hmm. minorities in Bosnia and Herzegovina because it's economic support in the context of NTA, I understood that maybe IPAC uh, has some uh, financial support for the, for the minorities or not. This I didn't understand, the connection between IPA, economic they support and NTA. Are, they aren't specifically related to uh, ethnical minorities. They are related to all kinds of minorities based on gender, based on if the, for example, the children that did not have parents, so they're more generalized, but um, I'm not 100% sure if they're specifically for minorities, as for example, your presentation was about. That's something I should consult my mentors about, but yeah, they're more generalized because they're trying to cover every aspect of the societies in Bosnia and Herzegovina, they can with finances. So oh, I thought it was worth mentioning it. I have a question for uh, both Oliveira and uh, Una. Mm -hmm. uh, because you were mentioning uh, identities. Uh, so in Oliveira, you were mentioning that these researchers are doing the focus groups and also speak to the people and how they feel about their ethnicity and so on. And uh, I'm interested in this because how, how do they really feel? Because from my research, what I did on collective identities of Slovaks living in Vojvodina, which is very closely, uh, generally, and maybe culturally, so they identify in multiple ways. <coughs> yeah, so uh, is this the case also in Bosnia, or really those identities, Serb, Croatian, uh, Bosniaks are so unidimensional? Because I think uh, in Slovak, Slovak community, for 250 years, they, they have very strict endogamy system. Yeah, but I, I'm not aware of such a strict system in Bosnia. There was more interference between different ethnicities. So, uh, do you do? Did you come across something about that? Do those yeah, identities are really so mm -hmm. unilateral. There is uh, probably a lack of social trust between the ethnicities. You know. And that's something what Luna said as well, and uh, that's most of that fellow people who live in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, if we speak administratively by the 
uh, they don't agreement, they cooperate, they, they cope with each other, you know. For example, I cooperate a lot with the people from the Ministry of Defense or uh, state authorities, and they are all represented, three ethnic groups, but uh, in a society, in local societies, and local, uh, local, on local level, I'm not so sure that they cooperate with each other. And that's why I said uh, from the research, uh, somehow they explain, most of the people explain that they are uh, for for the peaceful coexistence, more interested than for the uh, sujivot or living together all together, you know. And by I will just read you just sort of narrative uh, from the civil society of, of from Sarajevo, just uh, a sentence. Uh, there is a there were interview no name unnamed interviews with the people, but probably because this is European project research, so I hope the most of these interviews and uh, the and the sentence in are very honest. As long as we are still, of course, encouraged by the authorities and the media to count the victims and crimes, as long as we are our heroes and their criminals, meaning they're from other groups or third groups, I think the final reconciliation are and overcoming the past we cannot reach. That's someone from civil society from Sarajevo. And if you read the narratives from, for example, this uh, Dutchko district, that is really specific. If you say in in a map, you can find how it looks like. Like you have it there, probably it's divided. You know, you see that um, they don't cope with each other. You know, and in map you can see where live Serbs, where live uh, Croats, and where live Muslims, and it's colored by by different colors and only in one really small part of the Dutchko district that, that is recognized as a, as a efficient, um, uh, non-territorial uh, and territorial as well autonomy. Uh, they live in a really, really small piece of that uh, part and uh, they people live to, together and I pay attention in the research uh, how they cope with each other in the Dutchko district. They have their local pubs where only going out Serbs. On another side, they are going out Croats and Bosniaks. Uh, they they don't they try to escape violence between each other, but still, as I mentioned, there is very live uh, sort of fear uh, inside of them, and uh, something what we call in the theory of, of, of politics uh, actually a social uh, uncertainty uncertainty dilemma. It's always existing in, in between that ident identities in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And if you cooperate with them as I do, uh, you can notice that even no one will tell you so openly, you know, but mainly younger population doesn't like to, I don't know, to, to, to be go going out with each other, to, so to dating each other and so on, as it was I'm before the war. I'm going to tell you our personal experience because I'm the second post-war generation that was born. So I was born in 97, two years after the Dayton Agreement. Uh, I grew up in the Republic of Srpska in a strictly Serbian populated city, which is Banja Luka. Uh, they see themselves as, not even Bosnian Serbs, most of them see themselves as Serbians but purely Serbians. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting is that they celebrate things that Serbia wins as their own. Uh, they tell you do not go to the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina because it's dangerous there. It's not. Nobody's going to, I mean, it's one country. They don't see themselves, my generation doesn't see themselves as a generation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. As, as people that come from Bosnia and Herzegovina, they see themselves as people that come from the Republic of Srpska. So they do, they do not identify themselves from, as people who are Bosnian Serbs from Bosnia and Herzegovina. They identify themselves as Serbs. They're from Republic of Srpska. If you do not know where the Republic of Srpska is, oh, it's a part of Bosnia. Like, it doesn't matter. So it, it's, I feel like the issue today is that uh, parents that went through the war teach their children, hate them, love your own, which shouldn't be the case. I had the luck that my parents weren't like that, and they, they taught me respect. Everyone, you come from a country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, entity, Republic of Srpska. But most of my generation is like that. 
I think, and unfortunately, it's deeply rooted memories in conflict, and you can mostly see that during the celebrations that I mentioned, during the summer months, and if you follow up the media, uh, our colleague from Zagreb can tell you, all, us, all of us from the region can feel it, you know, how it looks on one or on uh, one or on another side. It depends which sort of celebration is it. I mean, which uh, memory is celebrated and data or the evidence of, of, of I, I don't know, from, from the past, from the conflict, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's something what we feel uh, uh, really deeply who lives in the, in the Balkans, you know, and uh, that's something what is lively, especially during the summer months, if you are sometimes here, because you told me you are originally from here when it's celebrating Srebrenica, you can see on social media a lot of people using the symbol of, of Srebrenica as their, as, as their profile picture. If they are supporting, for example, Bosniaks, even if they are not Bosniaks, or on another side, if they are uh, supporting Serbs uh, or whatever, in, or when it's Oluya, you know, you see, for example, on, Related actually for the decoration uh, case and uh, the decoration side, the uh, broad side in, in the conflict. So that's really, really, really interesting. And uh, sometimes, you know, you can stand how it's, you, you think sometimes, uh, I'm researching in the field, this field uh, for two decades, and you know, it's a long period of time. And I'm wondering sometimes how many years still we need to overcome it, or shall we do that, or maybe non-territorial uh, uh, NTA model doesn't need to uh, precondition re reconciliation, or we can expect it, maybe it's maybe better to apply it without fulfillment of this necessary uh, preconditions, as it is by terrorists, reconciliation and social crime.